Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 213, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Mr. David Gilbert. This part of the interview, we talk about the rest of the Wadget Eye Games catalog, including The New Guys, Primordia, and Resonance. We get Dave's take on Kickstarter, hint, he's not a big fan, as well as uh, the state of the adventure game uh, genre, the importance or insignificance of graphics and story, and much, much, much more. So, uh, without further ado, here is Mr. Dave Gilbert. That's probably why you're looking more and more into the iPhone, iOS, yeah, uh, yeah. those sort of markets. Have you been as, as, as successful there as you were on Steam? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I think the issue is that a lot of people have played the game already. It's done very well by iOS standards. It's done. It's done very well. I think uh, Geminaru did about twenty thousand copies on iOS the first month. So we're, we were very happy. Um, and so yeah, like it's definitely worth doing. Uh, we're right now. Of course, we just had a baby, so it's it's very Is hard for us to twenty thousand uh, units on on iOS. Yeah. No, which, I, what? Wow. <laughs> That's a wow. Oh yeah. I, were I, there I, people that uh, were the people that have played it on Steam looking for the you know, that were familiar with the game already, or was it just people that saw it on the iStore or on App Store? I don't know. The problem with iOS is that it you can track the sales and things, but you can't really track the people playing them. So uh, Steam gives you a lot of direct contact with the players. iOS, not as much. So it's it's hard to really to get, really gauge that. Uh, it also got featured by Apple, which helped a lot. Uh, that helped a lot in terms of getting it out there. Um, uh, the thing with iOS is that it's really hard to keep it in the public eye. Uh, it had a really good first month, but then it dropped sharply after that. Uh, PC and Steam, it's very, it's a lot easier to keep to maintain it uh, and to keep it going, um, to keep it in the public eye for much longer, simply because you have direct contact with the players. iOS, you don't have that as much. So um, yeah, we're very happy with iOS. Uh, we just wish we had the time to get more of them on there. It's just baby is preventing that right now. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. So you're a dad now. I am. I am. Yeah. Is your uh, child going to be a gamer? I mean, it's be either featured be in the, any voice work maybe. Between me and <laughs> yeah, between me and my wife, this ch this uh, little girl is either going to be the nerdiest kid alive <laughs> or become head cheerleader or something as as a way of rebelling against us. All right, so I don't have the year here, but I know you did a game called The New Guys. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was um, that was another published game. That was back in January of last year. So what can you tell me about that one? The new, the new guys. Um, it was kind of a, I guess it's one of the games that really sticks out um, compared to the others because most of our games tend to be like these gritty, gritty urban noirish, uh, uh, very serious games. And uh, the new guys is written by a guy named Chris Burton, and it was a sequel to a freeware game that came out uh, several years ago and it has a it has a big I have a big soft spot for it because I played it on the plane going to Korea and I just laughed and I was very nervous about going and I'm playing this game and I'm laughing the whole way and uh, so I had a really big soft spot for it so when he sent me the game uh, as something possibly to be published I was like yeah I'd love to take this because I, I love the characters I love I love the humor and and everything and I, and I played the game and I I really liked it I mean it just visually it's not sadly it's not something that would really appeal based on visuals and premise because it's got this like cartoonish ms paint look to it uh and it's about wrestling which is not really a very nerd friendly kind of uh kind of premise but the game has some like the best action puzzle based scenes i've ever played and it's just really funny and uh i, I really liked it uh, it didn't really resonate that well sadly but uh I really liked it, but being now that I'm publishing all these games, I can take risks like that once in a while. I don't have to rely on every game being a super mega hit in order to sustain us. So I could take a risk on something like that and get it out there and get it to help get it done and give it a little bit more publicity than it would have otherwise. So I'm very, I'm very proud of that. I'm, I'm I, I, yeah, I'm really glad it's on our store because I really, I really like it. Well, speaking of games that resonate. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna <laughs> I always have to usually add the phrase no pun intended when uh, I <laughs> so uh, Resonance mm -hmm. you know it seemed like Jim and I Rue got to you it was almost I think I, well the statistic was 90% done uh, this one on the other hand you said was only 30% that's what Vince done. told us yeah we um, 
when I decided I wanted to publish other games, Resonance was at the very top of the list because I had known Vince from the from the AGS community for a very long time, and I knew Resonance was something he was working on. And just the screenshots alone, uh, ironically, I don't know if that's ironic or not, but way back when I was working on Blackwell Convergence, I was. Um, uh, that's when he first started releasing screenshots of Resonance, and I'm thinking, "Wow, these look amazing! I really have to like up the graphical quality of my games here." And so I, I did that with Blackwell Convergence. I, um, I hired an art studio to make these really beautiful backgrounds because I felt like Resonance was now my competition. And then I ended up publishing it, which is sort of funny. Uh, but Resonance, yeah, I, I knew we wanted to publish something, and Janet had just finished working on a project and was looking for something new. And Vince had sent me a build of Resonance, and I played it, and I, it, it blew my mind. It was it was wonderful. And I, I asked him, so how far along is this game? How close are you to being done? He was like, I don't know, maybe I'm 30% finished. I mean, he had been working on it for four or five years, so I kind of called Janet over. I'm like, all right, maybe we can work something out. Uh, and we did. Janet agreed to program it full-time, uh, which was the main issue, is that there was no one... He was just did not have time to work on it himself. And so Janet worked on it full time for almost a year and we got it finished. And it was probably our best seller. Um, it did really, really well. Like it was um, and I'm really, really proud of it, if only because it probably wouldn't have gotten done uh, if we didn't get involved. Maybe it would have gotten done, but not for a long time. So we were. It's, if I'm proud of anything, I'm really proud of that we managed to get Resonance done and out and that it did so well. I'm really intrigued by the idea that you can play four different characters in that. Mm. Yeah, me too. Um, I imagine a lot of the puzzles revolve around that. Yeah, it was difficult to keep them, uh, to prevent it from getting overwhelming. It helped that each character had a very specific um, area that was tailored to them. Like Anna was a doctor, so all of her puzzles centered around the hospital Bennett, the police station, things like that. So uh, that helped. Um, yeah, we managed to keep it a lot. Uh, managed to keep it simple, but it was there was still a lot of complexity in it, which made for a, a bit of frustration, but a lot of fun. Okay, so I think we're up now to Primordia mm -hmm. uh, from Wormwood Studios, a post-apocalyptic game with robots. So, you know, how would you describe the setting? Because I know you didn't like the uh, way. You didn't like the cyberpunk label for that, right? Well, I think of cyberpunk as um, like dystopian future. Well, it is a dystopian future, but more like hackers and uh, you know crime-ridden corporations and things like that. Blade Runner, uh, Blade Runner kind of thing. I, I, this would be post-apocalyptic rather than cyberpunk, even though it deals with robots and technology. It's um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say it defies characterization, but uh, it's definitely post-apocalyptic is the best way to describe it. What appealed to you about that game when you saw it? The art style. I just thought it was one of the most beautiful, evocative things I've ever seen. It just uh, was really just gorgeous. And I emailed the developer and I said, you know, I'd love to take a look. Um, even if it's early, I can. I'd love to take a look. And I could. It was extremely rough. It was so rough at the time, but I could sort of see this being really, really amazing. Um, I, and I offered him, offered a publishing deal and he said yes. Uh, so that took, you know, it was, it was unique in that I was purely like a facilitator producer person. Uh, they had a, they had a whole team working on it. They had a programmer, an artist, a composer, and a writer. And usually you have one or two people doing several different things. And that game had one person doing one specific thing, which is why each aspect of that game is so good. Um, so it, it worked. I, I love it. it was, it's one of our most interesting, evocative games that we have. Yes, Not that I'm like a little biased, but... I mean, you're really getting into the development, the producing, or I guess I should say the producing role, right, the, as the publisher and everything. Do you feel like that's taking away... Of the time from your own games? Yeah, uh, which is why this year I uh, am not publishing anything. Uh, it was getting a little frustrating, especially towards the end of the year when uh, I just wanted to work on my own stuff. And I thought I'd be able to kind of do them both, but I just couldn't. It was just way too much work. Like it was not that it was way too much work. I did have some slower days where I could like open up my notebook and try to work on Blackwell, but it was just so. 
I was working with two different sides of my brain. Like there was the business person and there was the creative person. And it was really hard to, it's really hard to turn on the creativity just like that. Like, all right, today I'm going to write like the next scene of Blackwell. And it just didn't come. And I'd be stuck. Well, well, there's that day gone. Uh, So I really needed the time to develop the story and the characters and and the puzzles and things. And it just didn't happen when I was working on all those games last year. It just couldn't happen. So this year, especially with our baby being born, I knew I could only work on one thing. Uh, So I decided I'm just going to focus on my own project. And we're just sort of, last year was such a good year. Uh, We had like, we just got on Steam for the first time, two really good, well-selling games, and we're just sort of still living off of that while I'm working on Blackwell. So, um, and taking care of our baby, of course. And Janet's sort of doing the porting um, and when the baby's asleep, basically, which is why it's taking a long time. Well, talking to you has really gotten me encouraged about the, the state of adventure games. And, really? Oh. I mean, there seems to be a lot of a lot more interest out there in the in the genre that you know, you'd get from other people. Or the sort of impression that I've gotten from other people on the show. Well, it's interesting that um, I think uh, like I have certain theories and thoughts about it, but like voicing them makes me sound like a complete weirdo, uh, trying to voice them properly. Um, you never, there's all these, there's a lot of old genres that have like kind of died when you apply the same standards to them. Like um, you have old platformers and shoot 'em ups and roguelikes and things like that uh, and point and click adventure games and when you apply those same standards those have kind of died as well but you never really hear about oh yeah roguelikes are dead and now they're coming back or um you know old school you know uh, jrpgs were dead and now they're coming back even though they are um but adventure games are i, I don't know why that label uh, people talk about adventure games in that way and not the other ones i think because they're story based and you have an attachment to stories, uh, you have an attachment, you know, to, to King Graham and Leisure Suit Larry and and Guybrush Threepwood because, you know, you were them, you were in their shoes, and so you have an attachment to them, like you don't have to other kind of games. I guess I'm totally pulling this out of my, you know, butt here, but um, so I don't know, like you hear that like roguelike, no one says like. Again, it's so hard for me to vocalize. Um, in interviews, I'm often asked, you know, what is the state of the adventure game? Where does the adventure game need to go from here? Uh, you never hear that being said about roguelikes or shmups or platformers or anything. Uh, adventure games are always in that weird place where people think they need to be going somewhere or they're gone or I don't know. Uh, I never really think of myself as someone who makes adventure games. I'm just a guy who makes games. And adventure games is the kind of place where I am right now that might change um but I don't remember what your question was I'm (laughs) 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 what was your question again I was just wondering if you think that we're kind of in a resurgence period now where these uh this is going to become a commercially viable genre again I, I think yes and no I think that uh the audience has never really left. And I think that's the case with all these old genres is that the audience has never really left. There's always been a market for them. It's just that the AAA industry um, had no financial incentive to uh, really make them anymore because they didn't sell as much. They would. It's all about chasing the next blue ocean because um, they need to make money. But you have an underserved, underserved niche like adventure games and indie like me, especially with all these really cheap and free or free tools out there can make a game and serve that niche and do reasonably well. And I think that is the case with all genres. Like you have, again, platformers, shmups, old school RPGs, they're all coming back. And for that reason, uh, they're realizing the niche is out there and they're willing, they're more than willing to spend money on a, on a good game like that. And I think with the whole Tim Schafer thing, uh, point and click adventures are kind of at the forefront of that it works out well uh, it works well for me uh, being a guy who makes them and uh, and things like that so I think you definitely see them being more commercially viable uh, or at least more people are making them uh, so I think that's good I mean the, the more love people have for those games the better I do so uh, I'm all for that yeah I was reading a blog post you had written about Kickstarter yeah you know and that you seem kind of eh, well you know about I mean, Kickstarter right? I'm, it's not that I'm against it I, I just think I think there's some projects that I've backed and there's a lot of uh, projects that I think uh, are really, really awesome. 
I bought, uh, I mean, I bought FTL and I bought, um, uh, oh my God, uh, uh, Shadowrun Returns, even though I didn't back them. I bought them when they came out because they're really good games and I'm happy that Kickstarter exists or else they wouldn't, they wouldn't exist. I, I'm a little torn about Kickstarter, at least for myself, because I, like I said before, this is my livelihood and it's a business and I know what I'm capable of doing with the resources that I currently have. And I am very, like I said on the blog post, I know I could go on a Kickstarter and, and succeed. I could probably, if I really wanted to, I could probably do a hundred thousand dollar Kickstarter campaign and get it. Uh, the problem there is that knowing what I know about adventure games, knowing how well they typically sell, I am not a hundred percent convinced that the additional production value will enable me to sell enough copies to earn my living and fund the next $100,000 game. I just don't see that happening. And if it does happen, that means I'd have to go back to Kickstarter. And I just don't see it being a um, like viable business model years down the line of constantly going back to Kickstarter. I just don't see that being a thing uh, years down the line. I mean, you're already seeing... Uh, a lot of Kickstarter fatigue happening, and I just see that getting even bigger. And I could be wrong. I mean, my, my wife and I talk about um, a possible Kickstarter that we want to do, um, and we, after our next bout of projects are done, we we probably will um, if it's still like a viable thing that people are doing. I'm very, I'm always very hesitant to make a big change when it comes to my business model because it's our livelihood, and we have a baby now. So uh, I like knowing that. Right now, our business works, and I don't want to mess that up for like a big short-term gain. So I'm I'm very skeptical about it, and that's why I think it's really great for one project. Like if you have one idea for a project uh, and can't fund it any other way, I think it's great. Um, but for a business, like for a long-term business strategy, eh, I'm not sure. Uh, so I mean, I could be completely wrong about that. And a lot of people, I'm sure, will argue with me, um, but that's just how I feel right now. Well, do you, I mean, what would you even do with the with the money, right? If you had, say, twice the funds to develop your uh, Blackwell game, would that make it twice as good in the end? You think, or I mean, I mean, it really comes down to design, and that's why uh, that's where a lot of adventure games shine. And I think a lot of the problem with like why my games are typically very short is that I don't have the time. What I would spend the money on, and I, I don't think people would like this, is that I, if I have like a hundred, like hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, people think, oh yeah, you could have, you could finally have good graphics. And I'm thinking like, yeah, but then the games would be exactly the same. I would spend all that money on graphics and and still, you know, have the same exact design that I always had. I'd rather um, take that money and, and take the extra time to make a longer game because that's the thing that people really seem to want from us uh, my wife disagrees we uh, she really wants we really wants to have a prettier game uh, and I think that I don't know if people are tired of our old school graphics or not I have to come up with the game first and then decide how much money I need um, I wouldn't decide I wouldn't go to Kickstarter first I have to really think about the kind of game I want to make and what kind of money I would need to make it happen whether I could do it on my own or if I would need Kickstarter or what have you um, I don't know I haven't really thought about it, um, and, and there's so much thought and politics involved with Kickstarter now. I'd be going into it completely blind, so um, I don't know. So I've heard you say a few times that you know, it seems to me my impression is that you put the the story and the gameplay mechanics far above the the graphics in your games. Do you think Definitely. that's typical of adventure game developers, or? I think that's how it's sort of on the iconoclast here. Well, I um, I know Jeff Vogel said something really really apropos. You know, you know, I'm sure you know who Jeff Vogel is. Sure. Spider Web Spider Software. Web, yeah. um, people like say, yeah, you know, like he they compare his games to Skyrim of all things. Like, yeah, they're both <laughs> RPGs. Yeah, I guess. But uh, being a, a little indie guy with with limited resources, I'm never going to be able to create even something on the level of. You know, Grim Fandango or Longest Journey or something with, or even you know, Double Fine Adventure. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do anything at that level. Uh, I never would, never will. Uh, but what a what a single person has, um, you know, one person can create a very 
good story or good characters or something like that. One person can do that. So that's where I put most of my effort. I don't think about the graphics as much. I think uh, the next Blackwell game is probably our prettiest, our nicest looking game so far, but it's still got that old school pixel art and, uh, and stuff like that. But really, I'm spending most of my time on the story. I mean, this year I have rewritten entire sections of the game that I wasn't happy with um, just because I just want the story to be really, really good. Um, like before I even get any graphics done, I really want to get the story down on paper first. Uh, so, yeah, I put a lot of effort into that because I think uh, a good a good story and good gameplay can save, um, you know, mediocre graphics. I think Blackwell Convergence is probably our weakest game. It is our prettiest game, but it's definitely our weakest in terms of gameplay and story. Um, and it was one of our weakest sellers because of that. Meanwhile, Blackwell Deception, which certainly is not pretty, but is is the best game, I think. Story, gameplay-wise, everything. It blew everything else out of the water. I mean, it was our best. It earned so much more money than anything else we've done. So just based on that experience alone, yeah, like I put story and gameplay above anything else. I don't know if you saw my last uh, interview with Howard Sherman, but you know, have you ever thought about just going purely textual? Um, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I just not no. Uh, I mean, if I was going to do that, I'd write a book. I just, I think that um, I, I don't know enough about text adventures to really. I used to love them. I loved Infocom, but I just don't see it as being i know howard sherman would disagree i just don't see it as being like a, a something that could earn my living i just i just don't see it okay so a couple last things here uh one you said you were really impressed with these indie bundles that are you know going around now mm -hmm. so uh you know why do you think those have been so successful because you can get lots of games for cheap i imagine i mean it just seems so cheap to me i don't know how you guys are making any money with those well, I, you got to be smart about it. I, I think that um, what I my rule now, and I'm actually think I'm going to be extending that rule. Uh, right now, it's six months. Like I will never put a game in a bundle a month after it comes out. That's just dumb, uh, and just devalues your game. But usually, a game will kind of slow down in sales after six months or so. And after that, you know, why not? If it's not selling well anyway. Uh, if you're at the point of diminishing, diminishing returns where you put it on sale and it only earns a little bit. Why not put it in a bundle, get more, uh, get more fans, get more customers, and earn, um, you know, quite a get a nice infusion of money in in the meantime. It worked out really well. I mean, Gemini Roo, it was on the first Indie Royale bundle. We earned quite a lot of money that month because of that, um, and the sales has started to flag at that point. Of course, that was just before it went on Steam, but that's another story. Uh, but I think even six months is is too short a time now. I just uh, it sort of disappoints me that um, like Resonance and Primordia, uh, it was people were still buying it regularly, and then it went on a bundle, and then people were buying it for pennies. And I just I don't like that. Uh, I think I think I'm going to wait a year for the next one before putting it in a bundle. For that reason, I just yeah, you're in a lot of money in the short term, but I think it just devalues the game, and that just sends out the message that, yeah, I've got this great new game, but all you have to do is wait a little bit of time, and you can get it for really cheap. And I don't want to do that. I think I, I'll have a sale. I'll have sales occasionally, but I'm not going to put it in a bundle um, until a year after it comes out, just because I think it's sending the wrong message. So, Dave, some, for somebody who's never played any of your games, uh, which one would you point them to as a, <laughs> as a way to, as a, as a starting? It's, it's no, right. no, no, no. I've played them. Oh, I'm saying okay. to somebody, in, somebody in the audience who hasn't played them, and basically, which is your favorite, or what would you recommend as a, the starting place? Well, I, I guess I would recommend Gemini Roo because that's the one that, like, just across the board, people really, really like. So. If you like that one, if, rather, if you don't like that one, you probably won't like any of our other games. Um, but if you do, I mean, yeah, I mean, like that, that urban noir fantasy thing is kind of uh, our thing. Like they're from go, from there, go on to Blackwell and Resonance and Primordia and uh, and our other other games as well. Um, I mean, I'd say Gemini Roo is the best starting point because that seems to be the most um, broadly uh, broadly praised, I guess. And where's the, the best place for them to buy, to, uh, buy that? WadgetIGames.com, and that's Wadget with a J. 
not and a Jeep. Preferable to the <laughs> Steam, then, for sure. Yes, we'll be getting more money when you buy direct, but uh, you can buy it on Steam as well, if you must. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Dave, I just got one last question here. This is from sure. uh, Jordan Muscleman, who's the uh, the president of the St. Cloud State Video Game Developers Club. Uh, so he wants to know, do you have any advice uh, for young, aspiring game developers who want to get into the industry? Uh, um, make sure you got savings, <laughs> is all I can say. I was, uh, I, I sometimes... I think I was born 10 years too early because you couldn't major in game design when, when I was uh, when I was at university. I guess really just you're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw up. And don't let that discourage you. Um, just start small and work up from there. Uh, if you're uh, – and this is going back to Kickstarter, but if the, the first – item on your business plan is Kickstarter, then read it. Uh, because it's like with anything. I mean, if you're some newbie coming out of nowhere, no one's going to pay attention to you. So don't don't let that discourage you. I mean, do some small projects, get some clout, and then, and then work your way from there is the best way. Also, go to events, go to GDC, go to PAX, talk to other developers. Um, if and people ask you what you do, even if you're working at McDonald's, say you're a game developer, um, just as a way to make yourself put yourself in that in that mode of you are a game developer and this is what you do. Uh, so yeah, that's the best advice I could give. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that advice before. Well, I, when I first started, like I said, I wasn't taking it too seriously, but I, I knew it was something I wanted to do. Um, I was working in the uh, for a while. I was working in the garment center, and then I was you know, in Korea, and then I was not uh people ask me what i did i'd just say i'm an indie game developer even though i hadn't finished a single game and so well i hadn't finished a commercial game yet but i would just I'd tell people that's what i did as a way to kind of tell myself as well fake it till you make it i guess is the best way to put it mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that was my advice so dave uh, anything else that you'd like to mention that we haven't covered well um i guess all i can say is that i uh never expected to get this far I never expected to be so, get so far as to be on your show, uh, so <laughs> oh, thank you on. for that. I'm a big fan. Um, even though it took meeting a, a lookalike of yours to <laughs> to get here, um, I, I guess uh, I, anyone watching, thank you for uh, for just um, being a fan, being involved. Whether you uh, you know bought my games from the very beginning back in 2006 or you uh, hopped on the bandwagon um, just recently with, with Steam and GOG and our, our recent, you know, um, bout of, uh, of publicity. Either way, you know, thank you to all the fans out there. Um, yeah, we hope to, to be around for a while. So I guess, I guess thank you is all I can really say. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a brand new retrospective, and I haven't decided what game I want to cover yet, so if you've got some ideas, head over to the matchhat.us forums. Got a special thread there just for you guys to propose games that you'd like to see on the show, so very much looking forward to seeing your suggestions there. As always, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart if you have supported this show. Remember, guys, I do not ask for a lot of money for this. If you've got a couple of bucks laying around, please uh, send them my way. You can uh, set up an account over at the matchhat.us uh, site again. Got a convenient link there for you. And it really makes a big difference, guys. Uh, you know, I was thinking today... I, would, I love the idea of supporting the, uh, the content I want to see directly. You know, I think about the great shows that I like to watch, and you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just pay those guys uh, right out of my pocket, just go straight to the people that actually make the show, instead of all these third parties that really have, uh, they don't really care about the show at all. And I think you guys are probably the same. So if you like the uh, the Matt Chat show, these interviews, these retrospectives, and all this stuff, uh, please, you know, consider making it a two-way street. Just go to mattchat.us. Uh, go to the link there, and I will appreciate it very much, and I think you'll also get more enjoyment out of the show if you do that. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got a uh, Oktoberfest. This is the Poliner Oktoberfest, and a word I have no idea how to pronounce. It looks something like Wietzen or Wietzen, perhaps. Uh, this is uh, from Poliner, which I believe is... Uh, Yes, uh, from Munich, Germany, 
and it's uh, got 6% alcohol by volume, so it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Oktoberfest Wietzen here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this. It smells quite nice. Kind of a, a citrusy-like aroma there. Uh, not overpowering. Definitely not an overpowering aroma to it. There's not uh, a whole lot of aroma. But anyway, maybe there'll be more taste than smell. So let's give it a taste. Yeah, taste-wise, uh, it's got some mild hoppiness, a little bit of bitterness, uh, probably a little bit, I mean, the thing I'm really tasting is the citrusy, lemony-like uh, flavor to it. Um, definitely on the lighter side. It's, it's got 6% alcohol, so you know you don't necessarily want to play with this <laughs> or drink too much of it, but definitely don't taste that. It tastes quite light. Let me try it again. Yeah, you know, all in all, it's not bad. There is some flavor here. Um, I guess the flavor to me is sort of a high register, if you will. You know, there's not a lot of those sort of darker, deeper, uh, richer tastes that I typically go for with a uh, with an ale. Um, all in all, though, it's it's definitely better than a lot of the stuff on the shelf. So I guess I'll go maybe two out of five drinking horns on this. You know, I I, I bigger fan of Polliner's other selections. They've got a really nice. Uh, uh, I think it's a pale ale, or maybe they've got a wheat ale that I uh, enjoy. Maybe it's a do Doppelbach. Anyway, I know these guys can really put out some really good beers, so um, I'm going to put this one sort of on the lower end of the scale. I would uh, try some of uh, Paul Lerner's other selections. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation I have for us this week comes from uh, Khalil Gibran, a Lebanese artist and poet. It goes something like this. If you cannot work with love, but only with distaste, it is better that you leave your work. See you guys next week. Let them, let them loose, let them explore and, and kind of figure it out themselves. Because if you're creating a world, you part of the joy comes from exploring that world. So you don't need to tell the player everything about the world. Just let them explore it. Like that's why, you know, they want to play. Whoa, you all right? Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of dive bomb in here. Hi. Sorry about this. Really appreciate it. Oh, okay. There we go. Was there a bug or something? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I just had this wash just like come right down my face. I just saw you jerk up in your chair. <laughs> I don't want to get stung by him. I don't know where he went. Oh well, let's try to continue. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, well, that got that got my attention. I saw you attacking it with a, a wired magazine. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they get in here. It's the second one I've had to, to swat recently. <laughs> okay, let's see. Where were we with that? I uh, Something about uh, dialogue and something or another. Yeah, if you see that wasp flying... Oh, there he is. Maybe I can pop him real quick. He's, there's a wasp in his room. <laughs>